And our speaker today is uh, Professor Ramani Hatswai, who is Associate Professor at the Animals Research Center for Higher Education Studies in the West of the Um After his presentation, we have 10 minutes. Uh, uh, 10 minutes from our discussion, Dr. Fred Ongire, who is a sociologist, sociology lecturer at the University of the Free State. And uh, quickly, I'll just read through the speaker's bio, and uh, I'll give the floor to the speaker. And as, uh, as always, we'll give the speaker 40 minutes to uh, present, and then that will be for the discussion uh, with a 10 minutes time to, and then to open up the discussion. For like also people from the list of the members from the online and so are those who are playing with this world. So for those who are online, uh, you can also paste your questions uh, in the chat box. I'll be able to read them. Uh, but feel free uh, whenever you want to speak, uh, you can raise your hand and then I think I'll recognize you and give this. So I'll quickly through this the speaker file. Uh, Mlamuli Tire Katswayo is an associate professor at RMC, Center for Higher Education Studies at the University of Glasgow, South Africa. His research interests largely center on theorizing higher education transformation and decolonization, including the thinking curricula, teaching and learning, as well as explicating the colonizing institutional factors at the university. So, Patwai has offered 22 peer reviewed French publications, over 32 national and international conference presentations, and has given over 8 invited seminars for public regions across the South African, US, British, German, and Indian higher education system sector. He holds a PhD in higher education studies and then a master's degree in political studies from North University. So, Patwai was a visiting scholar at the University of Connectors. Eight school of education from 2018 to 19. He was the 2020 mayor and guardian 200 youth young South Africans. The 2020 2022 Andrew, a female career fellow in higher education, and the current Jake's gay with distinguished fellow in education. He also serves as a panel member of the Council of Higher Education's five year review of higher education in South Africa. In 2019 to 2022. Professor co edited the book, Decolonizing Knowledge and Knowers, Struggles for Universities Transformation South Africa, was published by Luke in 2022. So it's 12 minutes, I mean, it's 12 no one uh, on the dot. I'll give you 40 minutes. And then we <coughs> follow up by the discussions. So over to you, Rob. Okay, thank you so much colleagues for that warm introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to have a conversation with you around some of these critical issues um, that we are facing in higher education. Um, Edward and my dear brother, uh, 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 Dr. Mzeleni, I, I hope I can rely on you to abuse you a little bit more um, by telling me if I'm not audible or if maybe there's a technical glitch um, um, on my side. Of course, the irony is not lost on me that I work in the University of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, but we can barely keep the lights on and the <laughs> connectivity is not that strong. So I hope you will be patient with me and I will rely on the two um, colleagues to just keep um, letting me know in case I, 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 I get lost or I, I, I don't become uh, audible or anything like that. So I will rely on them um, to let me know. Uh, let me see if I can get this started, colleagues. Um, yes, let me see if I can remove this. And then you let me know if you can see what is here. Um, let's go to slideshow. You let me know um, if you can see anything that is here. And of course, just do let me know if there's anything there that may not be appearing. Um, um, f f f firstly, uh, Pro Professor M Melania Walker, of course, the Sachi China Education and Human Development Research, um, and my dear brother Edward for the warm and generous invitation um, to the lovely colleagues there at the Sachi Chair's office, and of course, my dear friend um, 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 Pedro, who has kindly agreed to be the respondent 
um, for this conversation. Um, colleagues, the title of my conversation with you this afternoon um, is going to be on Black Students and Social Capital, the last frontier in the struggles for transformation in the South African Higher Education Academy. Of course, I should be upfront with you, and of course, I should be transparent with you that this in no way means this is the final and last thing we need to talk about when we discuss South African higher education transformation and decolonization. Um, I'm, 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 I'm just alluding and flagging and shining a spotlight on this that's often forgotten and theorized and under research aspect of transformation um, that we are facing. And it's really to do with this theoretical concept of social capital and how hidden and theorized um, it, it, it is within South African higher education. Of course, I note Professor Louis Vincent over there at Rhodes University and some of her colleagues in the institutional culture debate, they've done some attempt at drawing on some of these um, theoretical tools, but it does remain still quite um, under theorized. So that's really my conversation um, with you this afternoon. Um, the first part, I suppose, where we have to start, we have to start by flagging the context that we are facing within um, not only the South African higher education, but much more broadly um, for us in the global south. And we already know about COVID and the challenges that we are facing. We also know um, 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 the curricular challenges that we are facing, the public university being contested and critiqued, right, that we are facing in the public university. And we see this from Chalala Nehru University in India uh, with the students over there looking at the public university um, as a resistance against the growing Hindufication, the growing Hindu fundamentalism that we see with the Narendra Modi um, administration. Same thing we begin to saw in Turkey with students using the university over there as a response against Tayyip Erdogan um, and, his, and his administration. I think Hong Kong was brilliant in this example where the students were looking at Hong Kong University as a buffer to A, protect and secure and guarantee the civil liberties there in Hong Kong. But I think much more bigger than that, they were looking at using Hong Kong University as a resistance against Beijing's go growing um, undermining of the one China two systems um, liberal uh, uh, approach. So that was the sense that we see, of course, with the Black Lives Matter and others that we see more broadly in the global south. We saw the same thing in Brazil and those other contexts. All that I'm saying, colleagues, is that the struggle for transformation, the struggle for rethinking and reconfiguration, the kind of university that we need in this democratic society is not peculiar and particular to the South African experience. I cannot in good conscience claim that with you um, this afternoon. It is a global South um, condition. And I've said with you, we saw the same thing in the Philippines, we saw the same thing in Hong Kong, um, India as well, China as well, America as well, the, the United Kingdom as well in those other contexts as well um, that we are facing. So that is deeply the context with which we are located in. And of course, I've already just mentioned to you that um, I'm in the university that is famously known as the home of the fourth industrial revolution and the emergence of this new technorational being, right? The individual who can compete and contest in this knowledge economy, right? Where knowing the basic skills is not just good enough, you need to be able to perform and become um, um, a new person um, in this, in this um, even calling it a postmodernist society does not do justice uh, to it. And I think colleagues, some of you over there could very well be frustrated, like some of us over here with the chat GPT and the idea that you've got a, 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 an app that can write and think and theorize and do all those things. So what does that mean um, for knowledge production? What does that mean for peer reviewed knowledge? What does that mean for report? What does that mean for assessment? What does that mean for this university as we are struggling to, 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 to transform or to reform? Is it a threat? Is it a new normal? Um, should we be banning it like other contexts? For example, the New York State has already done so in the US. Is that the, 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 the direction that we should be going um, for some of us as well in South Africa? And of course, it would be remiss of me not to speak about the rise and rise and the brutalities and the violence of the neoliberal regime in our lives, right? Um, those of you, some of you there in the academy would know about the brutalities of the performance management instruments that tells you the specific and classified and categorized numbers of publications that you need to do. And as soon as you fail to meet them, then we call you a failure and we begin to prescribe workshops and trainings and those other things so that we can be able to 
to to to monitor your progress and make sure that you are you are you are productive and you are efficient right where our students stop becoming students they become clients and you and i are involved in the factory production of knowledge right that's what you and i are selling now we are selling curriculum knowledge now at the marketplace right regarding what the market and the corporate community um deem to be worthwhile knowledge right that's the fitness for purpose kind of knowledge that you and I um, are involved in this game. And what would uh, an alternative reimagine um, um, look like? What would thinking counter-hegemonically um, look like in this growing neoliberal colonizing um, academy um, that we find ourselves in? And we know about the depression and the mental health that academics are struggling with as a result of these kinds of performance management um, instrument and, 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 and others. Um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on the post um, 20, 2015, 20, rose must fall and fees must fall, because that is at the heart um, I'm, I'm of my conversation with you this afternoon regarding seeing these um, um, progressive student movements as, as as through through a social capital lens. Of course, drawing from Purdue, from Putnam, and more recently, Ronald S. Bart as well, to see if I can theorize these movements and offer a critique to you regarding a, the kind of networks they're fashioned for themselves, but also B, um, what would the future look like going forward? So I'm not going to labor the point too much here because that is the basis of my conversation um, with you. And we already know about the Asana Madi student protest. Uh, my colleagues next door over there at Vitz University, about five minutes drive from where I'm located uh, at the moment, we've got students who are currently, as I'm talking to you now, sleeping in computer labs, sleeping in the library, um, homelessness, um, I'm not having a meal for the past two, three days uh, because of issues such as the middle, uh, the missing middle, the funding, accommodation, um, and those other issues right now, right? The asinama, right? While we, the assumption, particularly within the literature in South African higher education, was that fee-related issues were resolved with the concessions uh, of the fees must fall. With the 350 and below, that being converted to, 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 to a bursary now. And so the assumption, at least at that time, from the government to the academic community as well, was that fee-related issues have been resolved. But we still see the Astina Mali um, 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 protest still coming up with students saying we're still not receiving our funding, we still don't have money, we still don't have accommodation. Um, 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 we are the missing middle right now where we 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 we're too rich for Nes for Nesfus, but we're too poor to afford and have access um, to 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 higher education. That is the real case study that um, 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 some of our colleagues are facing um, um, at Vets as I'm speaking to you right now, and 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 the neoliberal obsession of the communique that was sent last week regarding colleagues teaching and learning will continue irregardless uh, of, of the protests that are happening, right? So it, it always feels like this neoliberalism is a fascist element uh, to it where you can declare and we all have to, to, to march to the same drum and that irregardless of the challenges, the structural challenges, the economic challenges, the epistemic challenges that the students are facing, they are irrelevant, right? Because the business of teaching and learning ought to continue irregardless of what our students are going through. That is the context I'm arguing um, this afternoon. Uh, that is the context that we are facing. Of course, we know about the digital fatigue as a result of the post-COVID, um, the COVID and the post-COVID university, right? And 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 us being asked to compete. Um, and to conduct teaching and learning assessment and all those things in the virtual digital space. I'm, I'm not going to labor the point regarding the inequality of the digital space. The countless students were lost online as a result of the of the digital space, um, and especially because some of our students are coming from the township and the rural areas. And so to what extent did that virtual technological teaching and learning practice um, isolate and, and exclude resulting in throughput and dropout implications. What does that look like as a result um, of the pandemic? Um, I think we're still grappling with that. And I don't think, uh, and I think the jury is still out on that. We don't have a final um, 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 analysis regarding um, what happened. Um, and our response um, to it as well. And I've already spoken about mental health and the challenges both on the students themselves and the academics and the COVID and the post-COVID university. So in this paper, really, colleagues, what I try to do, um, and this really talks to the first part, I try to do two things in this paper, but this is the first part that I try to do, is to comment and to critique what I see as the mismatch between um, the progressive articulation and enunciations of the policies and the legislative framework 
work um, in South Africa, right? Very bold in his diagnosis and very bold in what is to be done. However, at a policy level, this is where you see quite a clear and distinct um, diagnostic of the decolonial and transformative challenges that we're facing in South African higher education. But I argue that the real life uh, what Habermas calls the life world, right? Our experiences on the ground, I'm arguing, are still quite one of alienation, structural marginality, um, colonization, um, and the othering, right, that we see on the ground. And really, colleagues, that's the, the, the first argument um, that I, I, I try to make um, in this paper. It's just to comment from the Education White Paper 3, um, the National Plan for Higher Education, um, the Sudin Report, um, in, as, as, as far as 2008, right, the diagnostics have always been there. I mean, I think it was it was it was the Sudin report that was quite prophetic. I think Crane and his colleagues were quite prophetic in being able to diagnose some of the early fees must fall and roads must fall challenges, particularly in terms of curricular um, um, teaching and learning um, 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 and rethinking some of the knowledges that you and I are prescribing um, in the classroom. I think Crane and the colleagues were quite progressive um, at the time, but who knew that a couple of years Years later, with the outbreak of the fees must fall and the rose must fall, the same issues were recenter to our dinner tables, right? So all of that, I think the claim that I want to I, I wanna make, colleagues, is that at, at, at a policy level, at least, the diagnostic, the, 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 the enunciation, the articulation, the understanding, of course, Mahoba would argue against me and say, um, you, you, you test understanding through action, right? Understanding is not just written down. What are the actions on the ground? And if the actions contradict <laughs> that diagnostic, then really you do not understand the problem. I'm willing to concede that. But be that as it may, at least in the policy and the legislative framework, as articulated and enunciated over there, the challenges seem to be well understood and well clear, at least according to me. However, the disjunction and the social, epistemic, cultural disconnection is only seen on the ground with black students and progressive black academics experiencing this brutality on the ground. And so really, colleagues, that's the first argument uh, that I'm making is the disconnection between the progressive articulation, at least at a policy level, and our experiences on the ground. And so we have to admit, though, colleagues, um, we have to admit and recognize that in terms of the patterns of enrollment and participation, particularly within black students and the colored students as well, there has been some growth in the sector, right? So it, to some extent, um, 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 we can admit and, and agree with colleagues who speak about um, 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 this demographic revolution. So to some extent, I can concede that, right? So for example, African students in 2014, they were about 600, they were over 679,000. And by 2019, this number had increased to about 830,000, to just over 830,000. You see the same growth, right? You see the same growth, uh, a, 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 a small and a growth among the color student, right? 60,716 colored students were enrolled in public higher education institutions. And by 2019, that number had slightly increased to about 62,362 over there. Uh, for, 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 for Indian students and white students, you begin to see this decline in participation rates, where respectively for 2015, um, 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 Indian students were about 53,611. Same thing with whites. I think there were qu qu quite a lot whites, about 166,179. So let's take whites for an example, 100 and, over 166,000. And by 2019, the number had dropped from 166,172 to about 126,755. You begin to see the same decline within Indian students, kicking off 2014 with 53,611 and ending 2019 with a decline of about, what, 43,330 students, Indian students in the system. So for Indian and white students, the enrollment and the participation seem to be experiencing some decline. However, for African students and colored students, both of them, um, the increase in the participation seem to be on the upward trajectory. And we know from 2019, the overall participation rate is about over a million for students in, in the different 26 uh, public higher education institutions.
And reading the same number in gender terms begin to tell us a much more interesting story that I don't think is the subject of our conversation um, for this afternoon. I think we'll have a conversation with it um, um, another time. And here, all that I'm teasing is, where are the men? Um, that, 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 that's the simple question uh, that, I'm that I'm raising. Are they working? Are they dropping out? Are they eating drugs? Are they are they doing something else? So, for example, you can see um, that in 2014, there were about 404,365 male students in the system. Compared to women in 2014, women were about 564,784. But look at the difference by 2019. Women were up over 640,000, right? 640,333. Men were only about 434,514. I am not suggesting that we need to stop the enrollment and participation of women because there's too many of them. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> I need to be clear. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying, and I think I need to be much more careful now, is, is to comment on the differences now and to ask what is happening to the male students. Because the same thing are being seen when you look at the numbers among academics as well. From your tutors, your junior lecturers, your lecturers, and I think your senior lecturers to some extent. The, the, the large rate, at least at that level, seem to be um, female academics, seem to be women academics, seem to be women students as well, who are dominating the South African higher education sector, at least in terms of student enrollment and participation. And so I'm just asking where are the men, not to say that um, um, we need to stop women participation, but just to flag and say we need a, an explanation that can account for the declining participation in higher education of men, because there is that inequality. Yes, there is an increase between 2014 to 2019. However, if you compare them with women, there seem to be more participation uh, of women. Does that mean there's more women in South Africa? And so therefore that tends to reflect and to signify um, the increasing um, 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 participation. Does that mean something at a much more gendered and patriarchal level is happening with male student, male learners to male students as well? So that I think I'm going to leave it on the table, even though that is not the subject. But the point of me bringing up these two slides, um, both the enrollment um, and participation, right, as well as reading the same numbers in gender terms, is to say that we have to concede, you and I, um, that there has been some level of demographic um, um, transformation um, in the sector. And so what is my intervention? And I suspect I've already um, flagged that for you, right? Um, ar around this idea of a limited focus and um, transformation around the discursive and operational nature of social capital. And the role that it continues to play in helping students enter, negotiate and succeed in their university lives. And so I do these things through A, speaking about these um, differences now the enunciation and articulated progressive policy framework and the brutality of our experiences on the ground. But I wanna do something else as well. And this is where the part I think I'm gonna be drawing on for the, for, for, for the rest of my presentation this afternoon is to show how social capital, at least as formulated by uh, Pierre Poudieu, um, Robert Putnam and Ronald S. Part, um, to see these well resource rich networks and connections in education and the, the implication they have for those who get to belong and succeed at university and those who continue to struggle. And I'm going to be arguing later on that black students tend to not have access to these rich networks and connections. And so what they often have to resort to is these movements and strategic allies that they have to form to, or else they would have to negotiate what I would later call. But of course, Perry Six does this earlier than me. I'm going to be calling them networks of poverty. So they have to navigate some of those kind of structural challenges. So for the purpose of my conversation, so those are the theoretical tools that I'm going to be relying on. And in the interest of time, but I'm happy to ring Q&A to go back to some of these theoretical concepts and tease them out much more closely. But from Pierre Boudieu, I'm just drawing on the concept of social capital. Simply put, networks matter. And to bring it much more closer to the global south, and for those of you to understand it much more clearly, how you get a job is less on what you know and who you know. So the networks, connections, they matter, and they do have a meaningful, um, they do make a meaningful difference in your life. But Purdue takes it a little bit further and introduces the idea of conversion. In other words, Purdue speaks about social capital. Those are your networks and connection. He speaks about economic capital. That's your money. And finally, he speaks about this thing called cultural capital, right? Your attributes, values, your socialization, if you like. 
And for Bourdieu, it's not good enough to look at these as three distinct theoretical concepts, but he speaks about social capital. So take my example that I've just given you earlier around, it's less what you know and who you know that gives you that job. So simply put, based on your access to social capital, I know this person, right? So for example, let me pick on Pedro. Let me, let me pick on Pedro Konaman. I know Pedro, right? So therefore I'm gonna get a job at the University of Free State. Right. So my use of social capital has implication to become my economic capital. And because I'm at the University of the Free State now, I can get to take my child to these world resource schools and they can get to take bowling. They can get to take rugby, cricket, swimming and all of these other things. Right. That can socialize it to have access to particular kinds of communities and organizations. That is cultural capital. So, 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 so it's, it's, it's not just a, a linear conception of capital, it's also a dialectical. In other words, one becomes the other through this constant dialectical understanding of capital. Because I have money, then therefore I go to particular sites and communities and organization, that's cultural capital, and that allows me to belong here and know these people, that's social capital. So that's the dialectical nature of social capital, at least in the Purdue sense. And I agree with him. And Putnam takes the baton a little bit further and speaks about social capital as part of this growing communitarianism that we need. And of course, he critiques the growing neoliberalism in America, and he argues that Americans are now bowling alone because they are now self-isolated. And I think it's got a line in that book where he says they watch more TVs and they no longer join clubs and communities and societies over there. But the point remains, right, that social capital is dying in America because the brutalities of capitalism. If I don't do it, Pedro will. So I need to compete with him and outmatch him so that I can be able to get the things that he doesn't have. And that demands that obsession with individualism and only focusing on myself. And so hence the US market and more broadly, even um, the global north in particular, they're obsessed with individual um, 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 motivation and focusing on the self. And it's not what happens to, to you, it's how you respond to it. And only you can change your life, right? Complete erasure and silencing of structures and their capacity and ability to marginalize, ostracize and, 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 and marginalize you. And then finally, Robert Edpal takes the idea a little bit further and disagrees with Bourdieu and Putnam and argues that it's actually not the community, it's not the network, it's not the connection, it's the individual within those communities who become resources. So while knowing people is important, for part that is less important. It's not simply knowing them. It's knowing specific kinds of people who can do something. So introducing the idea of having the ability and the capacity to withdraw from your social capital. In other words, knowing Pedro in and of itself is not enough. I need to have access to him and to ask for a favor and be able to get something from him. So the, the, the capital must be productive. I need to withdraw. So I need to get something from that relationship. Knowing you in and of, in, in and of itself is inadequate, at least according to Dad to put. And so colleagues, in the interest of time, those are all the theoretical tools that I rely on in this paper to then begin to argue around the networks and connections that black students um, 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 have in South African education. And then I speak about these networks of struggle, fragility and support as being very, very important. And I've already made this argument that black uh, uh, students in South African higher ed do not have access, largely do not have access to these world resource and rich networks. And so this is seen, you know, most of these students are first generation black working class students who are the first in their family to come to university. And so the alienation, the marginality, the structural oppression that they encounter and experience in the university results in them opting to create these alternative networks and connections. And so, for example, when you look at the Open Stellenbosch Collective, where they speak about needing to form this organization to navigate institutional racism. And I think they, for them, they call it Afrikanerdom. And here they narrate the painful brutalities of, 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 of the political economy of the housecom residential system and the initiation, and now explicitly racist, homophobic, and intimidating it is for black students. 
And they argue that this is not only for black students, they speak about this uh, exclusionary practice also being um, um, experienced by black academics. We have to sit in through some of these departmental meetings and others discuss completely in Afrikaans. And you have to either learn the language or find somebody else who can translate for you and things like that. And so it's, it's all of these challenges, right, of trying to navigate the African conservative culture underpinned by this institutional racism. And so for Nyamjo, Chris Kunui, and others as well from the literature from the fallers, we understand that the central idea of forming these roles must fall and all of them is the alienation that both black students and black academics experience, particularly those of us who experience historically white universities. So it, of course, results in the social construction of student movements such as Rose Must Fall, um, Fees Must Fall, Open Stellenbosch Collective, Black Student Movement at Rhodes Universities and others, who all act as almost counter-hegemonic institutional networks and connections that enable Black students and Black academics to some extent to be able to navigate and negotiate pain, anger and trauma that they have to confront in the university. And so for Kamelita Naika over there, and, and she, I think, does a brilliant job in explaining it, right? The establishment of the Black Student Movement at Rhodes University and, 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 and the importance of this connection, right? This social capital network and what it ought to achieve for her. And of course, what was peculiar about the Rhodes case in particular was the, 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 the interesting networks that were being formed between the student movement, the worker movement, including the community-based organizations like your unemployed people's movement in Kremstown, where it, it, it created quite strategic alliances of, of negotiation and others, where student issues became workers' issues, workers' issues became community social justice issues. And so this is the idea that Kamelita Naika then puts forward around these structural alliances almost being inherently, by their very constitution, a critique of the failure of liberal constitutionalism. Right? So 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 those are some of the 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 the, the, the concerns. And so what is interesting over there um, are the are, are the recognition that the struggles are not only interconnected but they are also dialectical. And as I've said, worker struggle became student struggle, student struggle became community struggles. And we saw the same thing between um, the alliances between students and, and workers as well. Nelson Mandela University, Sol Plachi University, um, Verts University, UWC, University of Venda as well, we saw the same thing. UP, I also encountered the same thing. Right? Where these workers' um, um, challenges with the ending of outsourcing became student issues. Right? And so, colleagues, really, um, it's to comment then about the different kinds of social capital networks that were formed a little bit later on as well. And here I argue that, in the paper at least, I also make the critique that there appears what one could refer to as institutional inequality, fragmentation and differentiation according to the different kinds of social capital networks that we see in South African higher education. And all I'm really saying here, colleagues, is that the institutional inequality between historically black university and historically white university simultaneously created the different kinds of networks and connections in these universities. And I take the point a little bit further and I argue that those who found themselves in historically white universities appear to have much more stronger, well-resourced um, command and dominant media attention compared to those from historically black universities, who we can argue have been protesting since at least the early 1990s. Right? They may not have called it fees must fall. They may not have called it um, um, roads must fall and decolonization, but they were normally organized and mobilized around issues of funding, accommodation, right, and infrastructure. And so this inequality that you're beginning to see with those networks and connections in historically white universities and the networks of struggle and poverty, if you like, in historically black universities and the media, dominant public media apparatus in continuing to ignore those who live in the margins. 
And by then I'm referring to those at the historically black universities. And oh my God, I have not even touched on those that we call the stepchildren of higher education in South Africa, the TVET sector. Those ones, we don't even talk about them, right? And so that's the inequality that we see. And so I think Kimahalejo, who then begins to refer to what he calls the hierarchies of legitimacy, when you look at those in historically white university and the, how valid, recognized and legitimated their struggles are compared to those from University of Venda, TUT, Tswane University of Technology, um, University of Zululand, Mangosuti University of Technology, TUT as well. And those from the University of Limpopo, right? Those who live and operate and think and become at the margins. And that inequality. Right? And so this problematic with what <laughs> I think it's Mahale, he calls it the coconut pujuzi and, and the exoticizing of rage and anger in historically black universities, right? Critiquing these alliances, critiquing these social capital networks, even amongst the student movements themselves, saying we are not the same. And he argues that not only do you have this inequality, but if you look at the response from government, it seems to pay attention to those from UCT, Rhodes, UP, Vits, and others. And they get to be the stepchildren. They get to be disregarded and pushed to the margins. And so really we begin to talk about black students in the Bantu stands. And so these, these institutions continue to be publicly overlooked and they struggle to command the same media attention and public discourses. And of course, Salim and others, they write that they're in the periphery and some of those other challenges. But I think there's something deeper than that, colleagues. And so this is where I then go a little bit deeper around historically black universities um, and, and, and the experiences of protest action and the students over there from as early as the 1990s. And of course, we know from Sasso and others that they started much more earlier uh, and new SARS, they started much more earlier around the late 1960s, early 1970s. But at least in the democratic era from 94 going upwards, these universities and the students have been protesting ever since. And you can argue they never stopped. And so these students, at least in the Spivak challenge regarding can the subaltern speak, at least in the Spivak challenge, these students do not appear to have a voice. And so they then have to construct, um, socially construct what I call networks of poverty and structural marginality. Um, in the interest of time, um, 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 my brother Edward, perhaps let me begin to move a little bit quicker around what I mean by this. And no, 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 the idea of coconut activist does not come from me. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's Chikane who brings it up in his in, in Breaking the Rainbow, in his book Breaking the Rainbow in 2018, right? And how he, at least Chikane is much more honest than I am, that it was the coconut activist and the coconut bourgeoisie, because of their social capital connections, they could be able to command the public attention compared to those who'd been historically black and rural universities. And so these coconut activists, at least according to Chikani, and I agree with them, they tend to come from middle class schools and they have access to produce different forms of capital. Remember, your socioeconomic, your cultural, uh, your social. Leading to the different student movement taking up prominent roles and responsibilities. So for Purdue, that's a connection. But if you are Ronald S. Part, you can say it's these coconut activists themselves with their middle class background who are able to strategically use the accent, the background, the knowledge, the theoretical knowledge to be able to push back against the university and command the government's attention. Sorry to interrupt, but we have five minutes left. No problem, my dear brother. You are far too kind. I, I, I actually thought I, I, I had run out of time. So let me begin to wind down. So what are some of my parting shots, colleagues, um, in this paper? A, I, I, I think you and I can admit that higher education in South Africa continues to struggle to respond to the ethical responsibilities of transformation and decolonization. Right? And, and, and we're still beginning to see this mismatch between the progressive enunciation at the policy level and the realities on the ground. 
So A, that's what I did in this paper. But B, I wanted to pay attention to the different kinds, to the differentiated nature of social capital networks, at least as it is expressed between different historically white universities and historically black universities. And what the, and the implications of those differences are for the black students on the ground. And then I took it a little bit further and I conceptualized this term of the network of the others or networks of poverty, if you like, that black students sometimes have to form, particularly those from historically black universities um, as well. And then I set up a challenge for the field and I say, making sense of these differentiated conception of social capital network and connections in South African higher education is important and should constitute one of our big ethical responsibility in trying to bridge this unending divide between okay. historically black universities and historically white. So those are my recommendations, colleagues, that I make. Um, that A, um, in conclusion, I promise, Edward, in conclusion, right? The first recommendation that I make is, um, I assumed in this paper um, that social capital is a good thing. I'm not entirely convinced that is true. Right. So perhaps future research, including a conversation here, could begin to show the dark side of social capital, uh, the networks and connections and the mobilization. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Right. Um, 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 is that a bad thing? Can it can, can it be a force for bad? Um, can it can can it can can, can it um, affect us greatly in academia? And of course, we begin to saw um, what in another paper I call the dark side of student movements, right? With the militarization, the violence, and the brutalities that we see, um, particularly during protest actions, some of the buildings um, and others. Could that be the dark side of social capital, where people can mobilize and organize to do bad things? Could it work like that, or am I being unfair on students? Uh, number two, um, and, and, and just this is, 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 is from my other colleagues who are arguing around um, this idea of taking theoretical tools from the global north and bringing them to, 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 to the global south. Um, um, I, I happen to believe, and I, I, I told Utsapo Majingozi, I disagree against um, this idea of drawing only and exclusively from African tools. I believe in what Boventura dos Santos calls the ecologies of knowledge. I think it is possible to bring um, Bert or Putnam or Boudou to Soweto and to bring Soweto back to, to London and to explain some of the complexities and challenges there. Uh, for my safety, dear Edward, let me stop over there and I'm looking forward to the respondent and to the question and answer uh, that follow. Thank you, my brother. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I hand over the floor to our discussion today. This is Dr. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I must firstly uh, appreciate the opportunity given by the Chair in Higher Education and Human Development Research at the University of the Free State to be your respondent um, this afternoon. The paper I was given to respond to, written by Professor Fachwayo, was titled Black Students and Social Capital the last frontier in the struggles for transformation in the South African um, Academy. Undoubtedly, colleagues, uh, Professor Khashwayo is a colleague that I admire so much, uh, who comes from um, a very significant generation of student movement, which I now call the post masterful explosion of scholar activists who have taken time uh, to document uh, volumes of uh, work about the masterful movement and the overall decolonization uh, rhythm of higher education in South Africa and elsewhere. And of course, this paper, Black Students and Social Capital, The Last Frontier in the Struggles for Transformation in the South African Academy, builds from a volume of work that Professor Slashwayo has been involved in in the past three to five years on these questions. Uh, some of his three recent works that touched um, quite strongly on these topics, one being decolonizing the university, some thoughts on recontextualizing knowledge. Professor Slashwai also wrote the rise of the neoliberal university, and then also the raptures in our rainbow, reflecting on teaching and learning during the roads must fall movement. Definitely, 
a student of Paulo Freire, Nelson Maldonado Torres, and indeed a student of Sabel and Lovu Kacheni. So congratulations on these uh, volumes of work and milestones, Professor, and I wish you all the best in your future work. So the question of social capital colleagues uh, also, uh, I would say, belongs to the studies of inequality in education or inequality in higher education, if you like. And some of these themes have been tackled in the past uh, 15 years by Professor Melanie Walker uh, on questions such as uh, making education or higher education a public good, the promotion of human capability, resolving inequality, and also achieving our national targets on human development. Quite a volume amount of work on these questions of, uh, of inequality. Which brings me now into entry into, into this discussion by beginning by saying that um, what is now becoming clear, especially in the recent developments surrounding higher education in South Africa, is that South Africa it continues to be unable to escape uh, the chains of global capitalism or the, the international neoliberalization of, of higher education altogether. Because as we would know, in the decolonial um, cohort of work, we've always argued that there's absolutely no Chinese wall, colleagues, between modern development, international capitalism, and neoliberalism, or even modern development for that matter. All these phenomenons are seeds that grow from coloniality. There isn't any Chinese wall between all of them. Universities, therefore, become institutions that play within this template. In other words, universities are institutions of the elite, and they seek to produce the elite. And part of the teaching that I've been doing at the University of Free State for the past two weeks uh, has been a sociology uh, introduction program where we're looking at the concept of socialization. And we used the post-apartheid university as a case study where we looked at the fact that issues of language, culture, and norms, what Janssen calls the institutional curriculum, they are all forces used by the university as forms of inclusion and exclusion. In other words, you cannot separate the university and how it is designed from the global and the historical model of coloniality. In other words, universities are and where and they remain sites of struggle, if I were to borrow from uh, the, Marxist, um, the Marxist terminology to argue this case. In other words, institutions are signs of struggle because they remain institutions of the elite, they remain institutions that harbor racism. And racism as a form of evil will definitely not survive without institutions such as the family, the schools, and the university. Because one thing they all share in common is a sense of uniformity, a sense of loyalty, symbols, a sense of shared histories, traditions, norms, and the power to socialize. In other words, they seek to maintain law and order. They seek to maintain barriers of entry and exit. In other words, they seek to maintain racism. And furthermore, part of the expansion of this network or this social capital of racism advanced by the post-apartheid university as an institution of the elite is also the fashioning out of what I call vision statements that seek to position where these universities will be in 2025 or 2030 or 2035. For instance, in the invest of the free state, there is a, a fashioning out of a vision 2034, which when it is read carefully, sentence by sentence in particular, what you begin to see come out is the nostalgia, what I call the white Africans nostalgia of trying to turn universities into complete business schools 
so that they remain smaller, colonial, racist, modern, and being perceived as sites of modern development. In other words, seeking to turn the university into the business school where only those of the elite can come into this social capital and be reproduced as the continuity of this racial of this racial structure. So that type of view or knowledge is deeply embedded in the policy documents and institutional documents of not only universities, but also of the state itself. The Department of Higher Education and Training advances the very same notion of elitism, exclusions, and social capital in fashioning out its DHET strategy 2025 to 2030. You begin to see these trends coming true in that fashion as well. Now, my last uh, two points, just to, to close off. One of the glaring or the most identifiable moment in the rapture of this elitism that institutions have been advancing for the past 100 years, it's what Kolela Manu identified in a very uh, significant and voluminous writing. The NUSAS conference that took place at Rhodes University in July 1967, where Steve Biko and his delegation of students traveled from the University of Natal with, with a train to the NUSAS conference, where they realized that student accommodation was being separated between white students who were on campus and then black students who were sent to stay in the in the churches and also in the township. Biko launches a protest against this uh, arrangement of the conference, which was also advancing the policies of Rhodes University and the South African apartheid state at the time. Since then, colleagues, there has been a, an explosion of black student activism against the apartheid symbols, against universities being sites of the elite. Basically, there has been a continuous battle by black students for universities to become public uh, institutions. Therefore, the, the, the decolonial, the decolonial um, scholarship uh, that has seemed to have exploded since 2015 actually has its roots from that very big moment in 1967 that I have described. But one thing that these institutions have now done to decolonization, they have institutionalized it. They have commodified decolonization. They have adopted decolonization as a normal language of the executive elite of universities, similarly to what they did to transformation and reconciliation. In other words, Universities are increasingly now drawing back and turning back once again to being institutions of the elite that seek, in the words of Janssen and Walters in their recent book published in 2022 titled The Decolonization of Knowledge, where they say elite universities now seek to quarantine radical ideas. They seek to treat decolonization and people who study decolonization as a township within a city. So this relegation of decolonial scholars, this relegation of decolonial knowledge and, um, and, and, and also the liquidation of the militancy of black students by the professionalization of the university that is increasingly at massive levels is all part of this project of uh, putting the social capital and the elitism of universities into a briefcase of the few. Now, to close off, though, I would understand that this is a draft paper, Professor Slachwayo, because there are also points that require further clarity. For instance, you are not clear what you mean about the last frontier. Also, the usage of Bordeaux's cultural capital theory is not quite deepened uh, in the arguments that are made in the paper. And also the conclusion does not seek to return to the beginning because it only sticks to the decolonial questions that you've been asking in the past three or four papers and chapters that you've published before. In other words, the, the, the paper at question today, Black Students and Social Capital, The Last Frontier and the Struggles for Transformation in the South African Academy, 
is a good draft indeed that needs further work and further development around these questions on the inequalities of education that I have just tabled. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, quite some insight to people there. Um, we only have seven minutes left. We only have seven minutes left. So probably before I ask the uh, uh, professor to respond to discuss that, maybe I don't know if you might share any quick thoughts. That means we can respond to here in the interest of time. Otherwise, I can give the floor back to uh, to respond to some issues that have been raised by the discussant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my brother. Um, um, and and I think thank you to uh, uh, O Pedro for that excellent engagement with the paper. And uh, as he was talking, you know, I was writing down some of these notes around the liquidation of the militancy of 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 black students and others. And I completely agree with him because that is exactly what has happened. I mean, you've got um, uh, universities using um, decolonization. There's one university in KZN that would remain nameless, where it's the bureaucratization and the breaking apart of, 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 of decolonization, because they now have something called the decolonial template, where you have to now take out decolonizes your curriculum and things like that. Um, and of course, that goes against the whole purpose of decolonization. But again, it shows the power, and Pedro's completely right. The same thing happened in the early 2000s with institutional culture, started some of the debates by Janssen, Philip Higgins, um, 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 and other colleagues as well, um, Louis Vincent and other colleagues, where it resulted in the in the in, in the liquidation and the bureaucratization and the management uh, of of decolonization. That's really the struggle that we are facing. Um, two things from me um that 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 Pedro is that I must respond to. Firstly, I'm not very clear. I think he said I'm not very clear about the use of Boudou's um cultural theory. I did not use Boudou's cultural theory. Um. I only use social capital theory, right? Um, for the purpose of my presentation, I was only aligning, um, outlining all those different because I wanted to flat to flag the idea of conversion, right? The productive nature of capital, how social can lead to economic, economic can lead to cultural capital. So the purpose of the paper um was not in any way um to 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 comment on cultural capital. It is important. Um, um values, attributes, institutions, and the way they socialize us. Are very very important but i think the only focus for the paper is on social capital hence i had to draw the theoretical link from Boudou um to robert Putnam, and finally to robert s um but as well so that's one two what i mean by the last frontier um really that's nothing more than to flag a couple of things one of them is to argue that the idea of social capital in South African higher education, that's one. But also, be post the fees must fall and roads must fall has not really been explicated. So we haven't gone on a frontier to theorize, explore, explicate, tease out some of the role that social capital plays in maintaining, reinforcing, and reproducing inequality in higher education. And so me drawing on historically white, historically black, and those things like that, um, there is social capital. Absolutely spot on, my brother, by linking it with my previous work. In fact, I could have gone a little bit further and said in my other work, in fact, my most cited paper, I'm using social capital to critique the extended studies, the foundation phase program that universities have. And they are mostly critiquing the one from Rhodes University where black working class students are being treated like the township in the city because they are created in this program, marginalized from the rest of the lecture halls and the um, 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 and the other academic program. They have their own class, they've got their own studies, they've got their own lecturers and everything like that. So the bantification of black students at Rhodes University within the access program where it end up reproducing in themselves, where they feel deficient, cognitively unable, and underprepared for higher education. So by, by frankly, I'm teasing out all those different struggles um, to say that social capital is still a useful framework. It should be the next frontier that we look at. Of course, not in the colonial sense, um, um, the anthropological sense, of course not. But 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 more in, in, in the theoretical and philosophical sense that social capital is still largely underused, under theorized, underutilized within higher education, especially as it maintains and reinforces inequality. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we still have time for four minutes. Uh, 
um, for members online, you can either post your question in the chat box or raise your hand. I think they say hand. And I think uh, these employees from this room that will also want to engage with the question. So, This is such yes, a peaceful no. space, Edward. I'm, I'm not used to this level of peace. Normally, when we engage around decolonial challenges, we fight and we quabble and 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 and, and, and we, we we do all sorts of things. So to have this level of peace is unusual. I'm not sure whether Pedro has scared people off. I I refuse to believe I'm violent. So I don't know what's happening. <laughs> okay, Pedro, you have the floor. Okay, sure. Thanks. Uh... Thanks, Chair. Also, maybe to look, I, I've, I've received your your response, Prof. Uh, it's, it's it's valid. Maybe also another layer of of, of work to 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 add is that um, with the black working class students, the fact that institutions are institutions of the elite, it's not a full stop for them. It doesn't end there. They have they have shown that they themselves do possess the means to create solidarity networks amongst themselves, where they form social groups of coping, social groups of healing, but also social groups of co co conscientization for radical thought amongst themselves. Because one of the questions that or the fascinations of the media during the must fall moment was how did these radical ideas spread across the country so quickly amongst the students? And the answer is, um, the answer is that students actually have been forming informal uh, education networks amongst themselves for years, where, where they speak amongst each other about their conditions of suffering, they use pamphlets, they use mass meetings, they use struggle songs as a way to conscientize uh, one another. Uh, and I showed this evidence on the paper I wrote in 2020 uh, titled Informal Education and Collective Conscientization in the Face Mass Fall Movement at Nelson Mandela University. This was in the uh, journal called Educational Research for Social Change in 2020. And I show that from the campus of Nassim Mandela University in the Eastern Cape, why it was so easy for black students and workers to form a single movement so quickly. It is because those networks amongst themselves, those solidarity networks have been established amongst themselves for a very uh, long time. So whilst um, black students can be categorized as being oppressed or being excluded by these forms of social uh, capital, they do form their own networks of, uh, of, of solidarity amongst themselves. And then maybe lastly, um, what is also coming true, Prof, is that um, not only is the social capital amongst people and the institution, but also the geographic location of a, uni a university is, also plays a role in creating some form of inclusion and exclusion. The fact that universities are built in the suburbs, uh, in cities, they automatically belong into a particular network um, uh, 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 by themselves. And there's a work that I'm doing with Lebohang Lehodi from the University of Limpompo, where we are looking at the, the international housing market and how its commodification and commercialization around the world is now uh, infiltrating the private student accommodation market to further commercialize higher education as a, as a, as a, as a, as a private good in this country. And its implications, therefore, on how issues of exclusion, funding, the curriculum get manifested through that angle. So those are some of the interesting developments that the masterful movement did not look at carefully at the time given the conditions, obviously, of, of that period. But overall, it's a good piece of, of work, uh, Prof, building from your previous uh, key contributions uh, on this work. And I think it is also providing a very good conversation with Melanie, Professor Melanie Walker's work on 
inequalities of, of, of education and higher education uh, as a public good and its implications on human capability and resolving inequality and also its potential on how best can we achieve our national targets of human development. So all these questions, uh, they, they, they coexist with uh, each other on this discipline of uh, higher education studies that we are trying to build and critique uh, in this country. Okay, thank you so much uh, in the interest of time. Back to cut the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, folks. And so, uh, Dr. Peter, uh, for the session. Uh, I must say, it's not a lot of information. Sometimes, when you get exposed to this kind of information, it takes time for you to digest. So, as the tradition, we stay behind here as a group. We also try to digest the ideas and uh, probably think through and discuss it further. And we are hoping that what well, the product of this kind of uh, setup will be able to uh, reach you and also engage if you feel like channels of engagement. But I think for today, I wish to thank you. I would like to uh, work uh, for the session. And also, we are hoping that we will get many people. Thank you so much.